Grace and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus referred to what happened in today's reading from Numbers in his late night meeting with Nicodemus. <coughs> John tells us that Nicodemus came sneaking into Jesus because he was afraid of the Jewish leaders, even though he was one of them, but he wanted to find out more because he had at least some idea that Jesus was something more than a mere teacher, perhaps more than even a prophet, but he just didn't understand. But when Jesus looks back, he reminds Nicodemus and us that God works through specific means and specific ways to do specific things. Here, Israel, on its way to the promised land, starts grumbling. Whining about what? We're hungry. We haven't got any food, and this food tastes terrible. This food stinks. Which is sort of like maybe you or your children or somebody who you know would go to the refrigerator and look in and say, there's nothing to eat here. Or go to the closet and say, I don't have anything to wear. Even though there's things in the closet, now nah, there's things in the fridge. But it's not the thing we want at the time we want it. Israel was on traveling rations. And if they hadn't kept whining, complaining, and rebelling against God, they would have made it into the promised land, well, within a year probably. But because of events like this, other rebellions in the wilderness, the Lord condemned everyone who was an adult when they crossed the Red Sea to die before Israel came into the promised land. And they wandered around for 40 years. So when God speaks, we should listen, right? Here, there's no real warning, is there? They whine and complain against God and against Moses, and God sends snakes. And people start getting bitten, and people start dying. <coughs> we don't know if this was some sort of special snake that God created for this time, or if he's just referring to some sort of viper or such that has a very painful, fiery bite. Since the tents weren't being burnt down, maybe they weren't actually blazing with flames, but they certainly hurt, and they certainly killed. And all of a sudden, the people realized that maybe we were a little quick to complain against God and against Moses. Now, if you're having a problem in your life, if you're having a problem with God or other people, and you want to get God's attention, you don't normally have somebody else pray for you, do you? You might ask for someone to pray with you or have others pray, but you also join in. But Israel seems so put off by directly addressing God that they won't. Like little children with a big sibling, you go talk to dad. And Moses does. And he brings the petition of the people and God says, I want you to make another snake. Another fiery serpent to go with all the fiery serpents that are biting and killing Israel. It doesn't seem like there's any real doubt or complaint or delay with Moses. Moses makes the snake. And he sets it up on a pole. And the people look at it. And when they look at the serpent, they live. That's all the faith they need to have their prayer for salvation answered. Look at the snake. Look at the bronze serpent up there on the pole. And we wonder how many people didn't have enough trust in God to look themselves or have somebody from their family or among their friends drag them close enough that they could see it. As we're looking at a large encampment, Hundreds of thousands, maybe a million Israelites out there. So they're going to be sprawled out a bit. But all they have to do is one thing. And when we first think about it, it's kind of odd. Because what did God say not that much before this when he had Moses up on Sinai? Among all the commandments that he laid out for Israel, some of the rabbis say that there are a total of 618 but that one commandment about 
not making a graven image, part of having no other gods before him. But God is not condemning them for this graven image because they are not making it for themselves as an object of worship. They are not making it on their own volition. This image is graven because God wants it graven. This image is cast in bronze and set up there on the pole because God wants it cast in bronze and set up there on the pole. Because God does work through means, through people and through ordinary items. Just as he still does, through water, through bread and wine, through the voice and the touch of his pastors, through the care and the concern of fellow Christians. God usually doesn't send manna and quail into our lives, but he sends all sorts of help and assistance. And here, he tells them to do what uh, somebody said he told them not to do. But they're not making it for themselves. They're not putting this, as the commandment says, don't make it and put it in my face. Don't rub my nose in it, is what God is really saying in the commandment. God is turning that around. In a way, he's rubbing Israel's nose in it. This is what happens when you don't pay attention to me. You get serpents. You get bitten. And you die. You, your family, your friends, your loved ones, strangers around the camp. You rebel. You disbelieve. You curse God. And you get what you deserve. But... All is forgiven. God wants Israel to remain. God wants them to stay as his people because he has plans for them. Over and above them crossing the Jordan, over and above them occupying the land that he promised, he has plans for them because out of them is going to come the one who's then talking to Nicodemus in today's gospel. He needs to keep Israel around because they are the vessel from which will be poured out the Messiah who also will be hung up on a pole. Unlike the brazen serpent, though, which felt nothing, which just was hanging there, a still object, Jesus was flesh and blood human. And he could feel the pains. He could hear the insults. And in some ways, what the people are doing to Jesus around the cross, what they were doing already in his trial, and sometimes even before that, is akin to what Israel's doing. They're rejecting God and his rule and his love and care and concern for them. They're turning their backs on the God who promised that he would send a savior out of Israel and are trying to make things fit their idea of what God is and what he should be doing. Not content with what Jesus is offering any more than Israel is content with what Moses is offering. But Moses says, all you got to do is keep your eyes on the prize. One thing only, and you will not die, and that is, look at that snake. God also calls you to keep your eyes on the prize. Now, I've not been in many churches where they have serpents hanging on poles. There are some sects in the United States where they handle rattlesnakes and the like during their worship, but that's not what God calls us to do. God calls us to pay attention to his word, to pay attention to his son, and to look at Jesus and live. To look at Jesus through the eyes of faith. Just as Israel, if they look in faith at that bronze serpent, did not die. When you look at Jesus through the eyes of faith, when you remember him suffering and dying on the cross for you, when you come to his altar with thanksgiving, receiving his body and blood given and shed for you, God guarantees that you will live. That you will live eternally. That whatever the stains and the sin and the doubt and the worries, the shame, the denials, all the things that were talked about here in Paul's epistle, all forgiven all covered over, all taken away. Keep your eyes on the prize. There's a lot of things you can do in life. There's a lot of things that you probably should do in life, but there's one thing that you must do. That is trust that Jesus 
forgives all of your sin. That his sacrifice on the cross was absolutely all you need to live forever. You don't know how your end will finally come. Probably not a fiery serpent, but we never know. But you can guarantee without any doubt that your end is not complete and absolute when you die in Christ. You will be kept in him throughout all your days on earth. You will be kept in him through your sleep of death and you will be kept with him forever in the resurrection. There's a lot of different ways you can worship and respond But you can't worship and respond correctly if you aren't doing this one thing. Keeping your eyes on the prize, which is Christ Jesus. Don't look away. Don't turn and follow that whim or that enticement, but follow Jesus. Stay with him as he stays with you. Because even as we look toward Christ, as our gradual says, the one who created and sustains and completes our faith, So also Christ looks to us and focuses attention on us and sends his spirit to us and intercedes with his father for us. Covers us over with his righteousness and lives within us through his Holy Spirit. Jesus is more focused on you than you will ever be on him until you are raised up incorruptible on the last day. But he's not telling you to be perfect He's telling you to be forgiven. He's not telling you you got to do everything because you can't. He's telling you you must do this one thing. You must believe that the Son of God came down to suffer and die for you. That as Moses raised the serpent, so also sinners raised the Christ. But the serpent's now gone. We see that it was kept by Israel for centuries, but it was finally destroyed in one of the reforms because the people were going to worship it not understanding that it was not the serpent, but it was the God who sent it. We don't worship images, pictures, graven, painted, or whatever else, but we worship the one they represent. There is nothing wrong with those physical pictures in front of us as long as the spiritual picture is clear. Jesus hanged on that cross, suffering all that pain, all that desertion, all that abandonment, The denial, the sale to wicked people, so that you could live with him. And while you still live, to live for him. Living those good works that God created beforehand for you to do. Not because you're going to earn God's salvation, but because when you see Jesus clearly, you see people around you clearly who need God's love that you can apply, that you can bring, that you can give. And so as you're Focus sharpens on that one prize. Your sight also becomes better on all those other people who God prizes around you. And the opportunity to serve them and to love them with even a fraction of how God serves and loves you is there. So keep your eyes on the prize because Jesus will not take his eyes off of you. Focus on the one who saved you because he is focused on delivering you through this life into life everlasting. Because as you realize that Christ Jesus is the prize that you should focus on, that will save you, that will take death away from you, remember that you are the prize that Jesus competed for and won. You're the one he valued. You're the one he treasured. And you're the one he suffered and died to save. So as we keep our eyes on that prize, and Christ keeps his eyes on us, his prize, we know that we will live with him now and forevermore. In the name of Jesus, our crucified and risen Lord and Savior. Amen.